can see his shirt clinging to him better in night vision. <laughs> <laughs> But in night vision, it looks darker and it gives you that, that sense of uh, foreboding and that kind of claustrophobic feel. It just makes it look creepier. Plus, at night, things are quiet. You don't have the neighbor's dog barking and the neighbor mowing the lawn and drop bears dropping on you. <laughs> right? You don't have all this stuff going on creating all this background noise. So at night is when we hear things and we experience things. When do most hauntings actually, when do we hear most things? In the middle of the afternoon and in the middle of the night. What do we know about those two points in the day? It's the hottest and the coolest. So that's when your house is going to contract or expand. And that's when we hear the footsteps and we hear the sounds. And it's always in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the night. There's nothing paranormal about that, folks. It's just the sounds that your house makes. You know, Grandma, she sleeps downstairs, she watches TV, she puts her teacup in the sink, walks up, goes to the bathroom, flushes, goes in her room, you can hear the creak of the bed, and that's it for the night. And then you wake up in the morning and grandma's still sleeping in the chair. And then all you think is, well, she must have got back up and continued watching the TV. Or did you hear the ghost of grandma walking about? Because that's the kind of replay that's always going on, but you just don't pay attention to it because grandma's alive. Now you take grandma out of the picture and you hear those noises and suddenly it's a ghost. Not because those guys are idiots who don't know. That's not the case at all. But they don't show them researching and doing what they need to do off screen because that's boring. Nobody wants to see Zach sitting there reading a book or researching the history of this location. That's boring. They want to see him in the thick of shit making it happen. And that's what they film. And it's got to be all done in a 30 to 60 minute TV show. So a lot of people that are investigating now, their only research and their only parameters are what they've seen on TV or what they believe to be correct. Um, the problem with the paranormal field, people say science will never take us seriously. They won't. Science will never take us seriously because we can't get along between ourselves. We have people fighting over invisible keys to kingdoms that don't exist, right? This team finds their own Amityville house. This team wants to go and investigate it. This team says the owners, don't let them in. I care about that. She's a child molester. Now, she steals silverware. Oh, I don't want them in. And then that team wants to get in, and they know they don't want him in. They're like, hey, I don't know if you know this or what, but that guy from Germany picks and drives all the time. I heard he killed three kids back in Vietnam. <laughs> oh my God, I don't want them in my house. Come on, it's weird how there's this strange backstabbing mentality of people treating each other like shit. We're never going to get this thing serious. We're never going to get paranormal unity because nobody's willing to play nice in the same field with them. Everybody's out there battling for these imaginary keys. Everybody, I, I always say, when people start off with, oh, I want to tell you my story because I think it would be a great movie. Or four, there was something that used to bump underneath the bed. I'd be 
be screaming. And of course they say, oh, it's your imagination. Just, just, it's your imagination, just had a nightmare. But I knew it was real. So I experienced that throughout the years. And even through high school, I sort of had that sense of there's something more out there. And the kids would get on the, the Ouija boards and do things. I'm going, but what if we've got ability and we open the doorway and we can't get back and, and we let things through? What if, what if? And I used to always have this wariness of, the other side. And then I went to America and I saw those ghost hunting TV shows. Yes, I was inspired by the ghost hunting TV shows, I will admit it. I worked out that you could actually have experiences with spirit without having to be a psychic or a medium. morning and uh, thank you for turning up and say so how's, how's the conference been so far? Really good. Yeah? Very Exciting? Good. Learned all about ghosts and... Everything. <laughs> Everything. Everything. Fantastic. Yeah, excellent. So this little talk here is about numerology. So what is numerology? Well, that's a very good question. Does anyone here have any idea as to what numerology is? Well, I don't know where it is, but <laughs> oh, you, you mean, um, it's about working on um, using numbers to uh, for, for luck or um, certain numbers that have a bit more luck and positivity yep. or uh, negativity. Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what numbers, but yeah, yep. something like that. You got the right, you got the right word, numbers. Yeah. Charge your life. Sorry. It charge your life. Yes. Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. So look, I've just got a, a brief little talk here, just for five minutes, and then we'll get into some real green numbers and work out some of your numbers and ask questions. This is, this is interactive, so the more that you participate with me and interact, the better we will. All right, so. Anyone heard of Pythagoras? Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't from this woman. No? So he was a Greek philosopher who theorized the connection with numbers in accordance to happenstance relativity. So basically, things happen for a reason, and what is the reason? Well, we've all got freedom of choice. Also, the Romans, they said, nomen est omen. The name is the destiny. So names and numbers are symbols. They don't themselves make things happen. Rather, they announce and broadcast programs of thoughts, feelings, and actions that we enact upon the stage of life. My aunt made me a birthday cake, you know, with ET on it. It kind of spurred this whole thing, and later in life, come to find out, like I was saying yesterday, my grandfather worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, uh. and there's this connection there to what he may have known. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so, what got you into FBI? Why did you want to do the job? The that, yeah, <laughs> the X Files. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's just, I was in yeah. high school. And yeah. I, was, I thought it was a cool <laughs> show. Okay. And I was like, how could I do both? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, the FBI, I really love public service, and I do, I do love putting bad people behind bars. Mm. So I may go back and do that sort of thing again, but um, there, there is no, as far as I know, X-Files. I yeah. went looking for it while I was there. You did, yeah. <laughs> OK, fair so enough. How, how old are you? I'm 37. Yeah, yeah almost 30. I know I look like a 10-year-old. 
We're all ducks. We're all ducks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm all duck then. <laughs> yeah, lie. Yes. She's lying. <laughs> Um, let me preface this. So everything that I say to the other guys is my own opinion. Of course, I'm not saying anything that would get me in trouble, nothing classified, anything like that. I can tell you this much. From being outside of the FBI, I know more about these supposed programs. Okay? Outside of the FBI, my opinion is that pretty much every U.S. agency has sort of a black ops type uh, thing to where even, even as FBI you can go up to people um, and you're not required to announce who you are, okay, your intentions. You can pretend to be somebody else. And it's the same with the military agencies, the intelligence agencies. Um, so back in the pretty much 60s, even, even dating back, actually, actually the um, 1947 after Roswell, we have pretty much the first documented cases of people being harassed by government mm. agents, okay, coming up to their home and everything. Then we have 1965, a case in Santa Ana, California, Rex Heflin case. According to him, don't know if his story is true, but um, some people from NORAD, claiming to be from NORAD, came to his house and took away, requested the photos that he'd taken, and then didn't return them. Um, and then you have the, the cases where people have seen things and then you know, men in black come to their door and you never saw this. Mm -hmm. Look, the government being involved with harassing, intimidating, censoring, all of that stuff, I believe there are probably legitimate cases in the early days of UFOs, 50s, 60s type of thing. Nowadays, it's a hard sell for me. Mm -hmm. Number one, because and I can't remember, I'm sorry, because I've talked so much in so many lectures where I've been down here, I can't remember if I told you this, but think of this. You go to a UFO convention in the States, you're bound to have some guy come in and talk about how there are UFOs, or I'm sorry, there's, there's black helicopters out in the parking lot hovering, and there's black vans watching him. So if you see something like this, you can shield it from the camera um, and you can reduce it. And when I take my hand away, it comes back, bleed me up. Um, or it might be that you're doing this during an investigation and um, Dave Schrager talked about this yesterday when he said the torches, the LED torches, which I believe is in my jacket and my hotel room. Um, that when you're waving those things around, they can throw shadows, they can get the light of the LED torch and get straight into the camera lens and cause, cause the glare and anomalous patterns. So, I, I mean, I could take a photo of this room that doesn't appear to have any paranormal in it and come up with some kind of paranormal looking photo. Um, it's not hard to do.
in the cloud state. She had to go behind into the cloud. She's a strange way it's moving as well. The first object I saw when I was nine was a red spear. I've seen this time and time again during my life. I've had them follow me down the road. I've had them follow me on my skateboard when I was a kid. I've had them uh, hover above my head, literally 10 feet above me, um, just perfectly silent. Uh, the size of a basketball, nothing bigger. I really don't know what they are. I've seen them my whole life, probably you know, at least nine or 10 times with red spears. I've seen white spears literally tens of dozens of times. Yeah, 
Francisco was just the uh, connecting flight um, coming all the way from Snowflake, Arizona. I still live there, uh, where um, um, I was living at the time. Um, all the crew lived in Snowflake at that time. Um, a high up in the mountains, the uh, largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about exactly where because, you know, we're in Australia. But uh, there were seven of us out there. You know, these are the six crewmen who were with me. In the movie, they reduced the number of characters to, uh, you know, simplify the story. And there was quite a bit of fictionalization. So, you know, rather than getting into a whole lot of the movie said this and this is what really happened, I'm just going to tell you how it went. But. Uh, you know, some of the, the changes, uh, fictionalizations that they made are completely understandable. I had two brothers, Don and Dwayne, that they made into one character named Dan. And uh, Sheriff Waters was actually a combination of several investigators, even, even our famous UFO skeptic that was attacking us there on Larry King. Um, but uh, that was me back in the day. Um, crew cab that we were riding in. Um, we, we were uh, doing field reduction work, uh, which was, you know, to, uh, within the whole contract, you know, you know, several hundred acres, but there were strips through there that where we would cut up everything that we, we were thinning and pile it in the clearings so that it could be um, burned uh, in the wet season. That way you'd eliminate all the fuel in these strips and it'd make it easier to fight forest fires. So it was really kind of a, uh, rather than logging, uh, it was more what we call timber standing route. Get the hell out of there, you know. So I decided to stand up and run back to the truck. And when I straightened up, that's when I felt this numbing shock go through my body. It was, it was, I've never felt anything like that in my life, but it was, it was kind of like an electric shock and kind of like just being hit by a truck, you know. I'd had a couple of motorcycle wrecks before and it was that stunning sort of a force of a physical blow and electrical at the same time. Um, one of the crewmen, uh, Dwayne Smith, and not to be confused with my brother, Dwayne Walton, but uh, a lot of people mix that up in the, in the stories about this. But Dwayne Smith later became a journeyman electrician and he said that uh, and working around heavy industrial um, equipment, that when these giant switches would close, that surge of energy that he heard sounded to him like what happened when that blast of energy hit me. Um, in one of the, uh, in the police file, the sheriff's file, one of the deputies wrote a report saying that a crewman described it as looking like a long blue flame. Others describe it as like a lightning bolt or a, or a, a blue-green laser blast. But they said the power of it was like I'd stepped on a landmine, like a grenade uh, exploding, throwing me through the air so violently. Um, it's really strange to me that with all the fictionalizations that Hollywood made um, about the incident that they actually played that down. You know, in the movie, it's just like this little spotlight comes on and just tosses the actor back. But it was, it was so violent. John says that my body landed like a sack of meat, you know, that I was limp with no defending myself when I hit the ground. Steve said it threw me like 20 feet, my body tumbling through this blast of light so that they immediately concluded that I was dead.